So today uh, I'll be talking about resilient by design. I think uh, the previous talk about microservices with mentioned cap theorem and everything, I think it this is like the sequel to that talk now that you know uh, you want to build systems that don't go down. Uh, my name is Smith. Uh, I'm a Bundler Core. I'm part of Bundler Core team member. Until very recently, I used to maintain the dependency resolver. Uh, I also occasionally contribute to JRuby, and this is what I am on internet. I work at Flipkart. Uh, many of you would not know that uh, it's an e-commerce uh, website uh, in India. Uh, we we get a lot of uh, scale. Uh, we have a lot of scaling problems, and uh, yeah, and I'm very thankful for them to sponsor my trip here. So let's just start. So why do we actually care about resilience? Uh, companies have increasingly over the years uh, started depending on uh, software. Uh, and uh, for them, uh, at this stage, uh, any sort of downtime would actually result in loss of business. Uh, for customers, it's also bad because uh, customers are also relying on uh, uh, the software to be up. Uh, to give an example, uh, Flipkart actually makes uh, more than $1 billion in sales. So even a single minute of downtime uh, results in loss of $2,000. And the uh, interesting fact is that you know, uh, it's never evenly distributed like that. There's like no numbers like that are that evenly distributed. So what happens is that there are, you know, uh, 20% of times which actually amount to 80% of the total revenue. And it's during those peak times your systems are most vulnerable. And, and those times, you know, uh, even going down for a single minute could mean that you might lose close to $8,000 just at that minute. So uh, the companies cannot afford to uh, any downtime on their systems. So what would they do? What are they go are going to do is they're going to rely on developers, support engineers, and all of them. So the famous on-call is there just because of that reason. Uh, so it, it's up to the developer to make sure that he responds to on-call whenever it is, like if it's late at night or anything. And it's up to him to make sure that systems are running up. The second reason is that even the simplest system today is dependent on uh, other services. Like, uh, the, like at the very least, it will be dependent on a database which is on another server. And, and as the previous talk said, the network is un, uh, not really reliable. So in, in those kind of things, it's very important that you know, the, the thought about resilience should be put uh, at forefront. Otherwise, uh, like I don't think any of us here likes to, you know, uh, handle on calls over the weekend. Like uh, that's pretty irritating, to be honest. So, so yes. So then the question becomes, like, how do we actually build a resilient system? So, I think uh, in the '90s, uh, like test, uh, like like resilience testing used to be an implicit requirement. Like the requirement was that you know your core should uh, run. And you know it should work, and you know tests should be there, not be there. But it's like implicit requirement. Uh, maintainable code, uh, even those things were very implicit. And but you see, those things are not the same in the Ruby community itself. Uh, uh, testing code, uh, maintainability, all those things are something uh, that uh, a lot of focus is put into it. Like uh, it's not something like an afterthought. But the problem with resilience is that today it's more of an implicit requirement. The management expects that the system should be up all the time, and uh, the developers also think that, you know, okay, I wrote this system, I use this data store, I have that, it's going to, you know, it's going to be up. And, uh, and I think it's like, I think if you, there is no thought put into resilience, like when designing the system, uh, 
you'll be very lucky to find any bugs before production because most of the bugs that you see that dealt will deal with the resilience of the system uh, uh, happen in the production environment, happen when the load, uh, uh, the systems are at peak load, the utilization is up. That's when you see those bugs. And, uh, and because you haven't thought about it, they are going to come and bite you. Uh, there's just no other way around. The second thing is that human bias. So humans have inherently a bias that they only think about the happy path, where you know everything is working, like your caching servers are up, your database is there, the services that you're talking to are responding every time you make a request. And that's why you know we, we fail to see the, the path where those things are not actually up. They, they, those things when they're not actually working. And so, the only way to actually think uh, in a different way is that we need to think about resilience from the start. Like whenever you think about your system, like whenever you are designing your system, you need to think about, okay, uh, uh, if my system uh, goes down, if uh, like, okay, have I planned for capacity if my caching servers uh, go down or are they highly available? All those thoughts have to be put in from start. Uh, there are things that actually can help you, and that's what my talk is about, uh, uh, resilient design patterns. However, uh, I would like to put up a disclaimer uh, for this talk that th these are not silver bullet. Like, I mean, it's not that if you use all of these patterns uh, in your system and they are guaranteed to never go down. Uh, things are never simple as that. A uh, lot of the uh, thing uh, that it depends, it depends on the domain as well, like the, the, the system that you're designing. For example, uh, on Flipkart website, our core uh, thing is to, you know, able to serve the product page for the customer to see if it's available, and once he clicks on buy, uh, he should get uh, whatever he has ordered. That is our main thing. So if recommendation system is facing an issue, we could load the page without it. If the comments or reviews are not showing up, we can uh, decide to you know, not show them if those systems are down. Obviously, for each uh, service, those kind of uh, uh, trade-offs are very dependent on it. Like, uh, for example, Netflix, uh, uh, if their bookmarking service uh, uh, is down, what they do is uh, they will not give you an option of uh, resume resuming the playback. They'll just start from there. But uh, the reason why they do that is that they know the main thing is to able to watch the videos. And hence, that, hence, the only thing that I want to say that it depends on your domain. It depends on how you have designed your uh, systems. And I think that's a really good thing because uh, like, there's really no free lunch. If you're designing a system uh, like this, you need to put thought into it. And you need to think about the uh, cases. So, so yeah, with that in mind, let's just start with the patterns. Uh, so I think this is the most important pattern uh, in this talk, like this is why I'm putting it first. Like if you don't take anything out of this talk, like uh, anything else, just take this pattern out of it. The, the thing is that, you know, the most uh, uh, wastage of resources is like burning cycles and clock times only to get results that you have to throw away. Uh, failing fast it's the best thing you can do if the system, the other services that you're talking to are, uh, are not responding or you know are going to fail. In fact, uh, the reason uh, behind uh, failing fast actually comes from a mathematical idea called queuing theory. So uh, this is John Little's law uh, for those who know. So the length of a queue, uh, so say your uh, system actually you know, uh, handles incoming messages and uh, that's it. So your length of your queue is going to be dependent upon the arrival of your messages and the amount of time it takes for them uh, in the system, like the amount of time it takes to process them. Uh, if your response times uh, go up, the amount of time in the system goes up, the size of the queue will increase. Like, so. So now let's say uh, 
if you're talking to a, a service uh, which is not responding, and you know you didn't even bother to change the default timeout of net HTTP, which is 60 seconds, it's going to take 60 seconds for your uh, uh, till it, it's going to take 60 seconds for it to fail. So your response times will be very very high, and that will indirectly increase the uh, queue size. Uh, the other thing that uh, uh, is highly dependent on your responses is your utilization of your uh, system. So the utilization uh, uh, goes, uh, if you see this graph, the utilization uh, uh, goes up if the response time goes up. So uh, if for each request, if it's taking 60 seconds, your uh, utilization of your entire service will be very, very high. And the only way you can do anything about this is to, you know, you can only add more servers and, you know, hope for the best uh, in this kind of scenario. The cool thing about this is, like, you can also look at the other way. So say, you know, you optimize your code, like you did your best and, you know, you got the response times to uh, a certain extent. After that, if your utilization is going above 80% still, like if you're going about 80%, uh, you can easily see that uh, uh, it's going to have a very negative uh, impact on your performance of your system. And that point, you, will, you can uh, do capacity planning on based on that. And I think uh, the other thing that's uh, very cool about this is uh, that say you are an agile team and this the utilization of your team is uh, around 90%, and now your manager comes with some ad hoc task. Uh, just using que queuing theory, you can figure out that you know the turnaround time for that particular task is going to be very, very high. Uh, so I think uh, the, like math is pretty cool. Uh, you cannot run away from the math. So the only thing you can do is, uh, like in uh, this case, is that you keep your response times uh, as low as possible. So, so this is one uh, example system that I have uh, created for to just to illustrate. So, say uh, you have an ebook uh, download service. Like if you buy the ebook, uh, they guarantee that they give you an SLA of five minutes. Like if you buy the ebook in five minutes, you'll get an email with the download link, and you can download it. And this is pretty basic stuff. You have a checkout service uh, which uh, sends out uh, messages to the payment service uh, through a message queue because we don't want to lose those messages. And the payment uh, talks to an external service to verify that you know this payment is authentic, and uh, and then it you know it, it processes further. Now let's assume that the external service that we are talking to. Uh, uh, starts failing, that it starts timing out. So intermediate calls are uh, failing uh, when talking to the external service. Now what's happening there is that uh, uh, each payment call to external service is going to fail. It's going to take 60 seconds. And because of that, the incoming uh, uh, messages, uh, their rate you can't really control in this case. So what's going to happen is that messages are going to start piling up in that queue, uh, that message queue. At this uh, stage, what happens is even if the system comes up, even if the system comes live, uh, external server, what you would have is uh, you would have a pile of messages. Uh, uh, and uh, now you would also have incoming messages from uh, the website. Like people are still placing orders. So you would fail to meet the SLA for orders which were placed when the external service was down. And you will also, because of that, you'll also fail to meet the uh, expectation for newly placed orders. In case of that, in case of that, like we embrace that things are going to be bad. Uh, we use a circuit breaker uh, in between. We realize that the call to external services are going to fail. And what we do is, in fallback, what we do is we store those messages, uh, retry them later. And uh, because of that, our uh, response times are still the same. So what it's going to do is your messaging queue will still be uh, empty because your response times are actually much better because it's not even bothering to call the external service. In this case, uh, when the system actually comes up, uh, what you can do is uh, newly placed orders 
can uh, meet the SLA, like uh, they still get the download links, and the messages which are stored in a different system or a different queue uh, and to retry later, you can, you know, uh, you know those, uh, those uh, messages, I mean, those customers will not get uh, their uh, download link on time. You can send out a special mail or you can you know, give them some discount. But the main thing is, in this scenario, you are in control. Like, you know that this messages are the ones that have failed. And uh, uh, you can uh, design your system. You're not dependent on it. So, so yes, so this is the uh, most important thing. Uh, in this talk, but now let's say now how do we actually you know make use of it? So the first thing to you know achieve uh, that is to bounding. Like you need so uh, if any place in your system if you have unbounded access to resources, that is something really really terrible. Like you don't want anything like that. So in bounding, I want to cover three things. Like bounding is a huge topic of its own, but I specifically want to cover three things. The first is timeouts. So uh, the default timeouts in any of your library are horrible. And uh, like NAT HTTP, like I mentioned earlier, has a timeout of 60 seconds. So it takes uh, 60 seconds for you know, the read timeout to kick in and tell you that you, know, you can't uh, access that uh, server you're trying to go. Uh, and the, I think the scary part is that some of the system, uh, uh, things don't have a timeout at all. Like they never time out. Uh, we had a system at uh, Flipkart. Uh, uh, what what we used it for was to, so it would collect uh, messages uh, from the local service and uh, it will send it to the main messaging queue. Uh, it, uh, its job was to relay those messages and. Uh, only through this service, the, uh, uh, only through this infra piece, uh, any service would be able to talk with the outside world. Now, uh, this service, so, I mean, this infra piece would uh, get hung uh, every two weeks or three weeks or so. Uh, it's written in Ruby, and we couldn't figure out like what was uh, wrong. And like when we went down into it, when we looked there, what we found out that it uh, sent uh, matrices to stats D on your UDB port. And uh, there was one matrices that we were not reading at all. It was uh, kind of like nobody was making use of it. And what that was causing is the buffer size of the UDP is 128 KB uh, in Linux. And it, that was getting full. So if that is full uh, at that point, uh, uh, you, uh, uh, it would just uh, uh, get stuck uh, in that state. and. Uh, uh, the only way to like there are uh, the way we solved it was that we use a socket uh, a non block uh, flag uh, which is you can do it uh, using write non block in uh, ruby but uh, so yeah so some uh, systems don't even have a timeout like and the, those kind of things you need to look down in your uh, application and see like does my application have a proper timeout uh, and the greatest thing the timeout provides is a fault isolation so if it's another service or another uh, uh, thing that is uh, uh, not responding it uh, it shields your system like you can have a timeout and uh, you can uh, use timeout uh, in conjunction with the circuit breaker, which is the next pattern I'll talk about. Or uh, you can, if nothing else, you can use it with the retry, retry logic. The second thing is uh, limit uh, memory use. So uh, again, uh, whenever uh, uh, folk, uh, people use caching or something like Redis, uh, this is something they uh, completely forget about, like limiting their memory use, or or say uh, or say even their web servers, like application servers. In those cases, like uh, uh, in case of Unicorn, you can have a wa watch on each of your workers, and you can say that you know. Till 85%, it's OK. As soon as it crosses above 85%, you can have, a, you, can, you, know, you can notify the developers or something like that. The thing that happens is that when you don't have any of it and you let, uh, so 
Uh, there was another case at uh, Flipkart itself. Uh, what we had was that we had a system, and every again, every two three weeks, the it would the memory usage would increase so much that it would start to use the swap, and the performance of that particular uh, host would be uh, really, really terrible. When we actually looked into that, uh, uh, we found out that at one place it was doing a JSON parse and it was using symbols. And uh, unfortunately, one of the keys was uh, unique every time, every single time. And uh, that was actually, and those for who are new to uh, like Ruby, uh, G symbols were are not garbage collected till very recently in Ruby 2.2. Uh, so any symbol that you created in your system, they'll stay till you restart your process. I mean, kill and restart your process. So in the, that case, uh, however, we none of us had to you know get up uh, late at night or early in the morning to fix any of the system. Uh, what we had was a uh, work. We had a worker monitoring uh, system. Uh, and what it would do is if it if the worker would go above 90 percent it would actually restart the worker and uh, uh, and you know things would still go and work well uh, or if it crosses uh, yeah uh, so so that helped us out a lot like I think that's not actually an ideal solution, but what it gives you is time to actually debug the issue. Otherwise, anytime if it starts hitting the swap, you uh, uh, it's going to impact the business, and that is something that you cannot uh, uh, take. The other point is to you know limit CPU. So. Like a lot of times, what happens is that on your uh, host, there are demon processes running that you know that do certain things, maybe provide health checks or things like that. And uh, those processes are you know are not the primary thing that's running. It's your service that's running on that host, uh, which is the most important. But sometimes what happens is that the code in that demon or something like that. I mean, the library you're using uh, goes into some kind of an infinite loop, or it starts using more and more of the resources of the system. Uh, however, you can easily limit that D1 uh, using C groups, uh, and what that provides you is like an isolation. So. Uh, even if you know that daemon starts to use all your resources, it's only using one core of your system, and uh, because of that, uh, it will not go down. And, fi uh, and finally, uh, every time you use a uh, mutex dot lock uh, or a, uh, like a buffer in your system, all of those are implicit queues in your system, which you have no control over. Like there's no control over those things. And it is much better to have an explicit bounded queue, like a messaging queue which sends messages to your service. And uh, what you, uh, and that could be bounded. Like it, it could you know, apply back pressure in the case of uh, it's full. Uh, what this gives you is much more control and, uh, over just using an implicit uh, queue. So uh, the next pattern, uh, I think, it's one of the coolest patterns uh, in existence. Uh, it's called the circuit breaker pattern. Uh, so circuit breakers, uh, the way they work is they, uh, they, uh, they are in between the client and the server or the supplier. Uh, and what they do is like if everything is fine, uh, then, then yeah, it, it doesn't actually even come into play. But it's when that, you know, you make a request uh, and it starts timing out. There is some connection problem between the client and the server. And in this case, what it does is that uh, after a certain uh, threshold of errors, uh, it realizes that you know uh, that uh, the other service is uh, facing some difficulty, like it's not able to do it. So it actually trips the circuit. At that point onwards, it, uh, any future calls are not even made to the server. What it does is it, uh, it fails right then and there. Uh, later on, what happens is that after a 
certain uh, point of time, what it will do is it will actually uh, make a call to that other service and it will see if you know it's up or not. If it's uh, up, it uh, closes the circuit and everything goes back to normal. Uh, but uh, if it's still uh, you know timing out, uh, it will uh, keep in the uh, it will uh, the circuit will still be in open state and uh, you wouldn't even need to make the call to it. Like uh, there are um, uh, really good examples of uh, circuit breakers. Uh, uh, I think Samian uh, by Shopify uh, is a pretty good uh, implementation in Ruby for circuit breakers. Uh, and if you use JRuby, you can uh, just make use of Hystrix, uh, which is written by Netflix. Uh, it's a very well written and battle tested library. So that is something you can do. Uh, going forward, uh, I think. Uh, uh, Going forward, like there are the uh, bulkheads are actually a concept that comes from ship. Uh, it it uh, bulkheads are actually watertight compartments in your ship. So even if your hull is damaged by at a certain uh, partially damaged, it will uh, it will it won't sink the uh, ship. So the idea behind is that a single failure doesn't bring down the entire ship, and that is something that you can actually use in your service. So say. Uh, you your uh, website uh, and uh, you know like in logistics both need a product service a product information so website needs pr product information to you know show it to the user logistics needs to know the product information to determine if the item is dangerous or you know uh, can it be transported using air or you know road depending on what ca category the item is now in this case say the website is uh, facing tremendous load like a uh, lot of people there's some uh, uh, like so there's a product launch and you know a lot of people are making use of it so what's going to happen is that the load on website is going to uh, affect the pro product service so eventually what's going to happen is that the website will bring down uh, product service because of the uh, high load it's experiencing so at that point even logistics can't do anything uh, uh, even logistics is impacted and once the logistics system is down any systems which are dependent on that service will also go down and this could actually trigger a cascading failure throughout the system like each dependent piece going down However, using the bulkhead pattern, what we can do is we can actually have a dedicated servers for uh, uh, the website and logistics in the product service. So even if the other one is experiencing a lot of problems, uh, the other service is actually shielded by it. Like it won't be impacted by that. Uh, and the thing is, like uh, uh, bulkheads are not are very different from adding more capacity. Like adding more capacity uh, uh, could still result in the problems that I mentioned earlier. Here it's uh, separating the servers so both of them don't impact each other. However, there are multiple other things you, uh, uh, which you can also use for bulkheads for. So, so bulkhead as a concept is very powerful. So say uh, you you're using circuit breakers and you know you have a thread pool. Uh, 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 for each of the service uh, while making the call. And uh, each of those are different thread pools. And one of the thread pools you realize is completely saturated. You realize that there is no free threads. At that point, you, you can actually fail to call that service. Like you can fail there and you can use the fallback instead. Uh, so in that sense, one system will not forcibly uh, bring down everything else. And finally, the last thing that I actually want to talk about is steady state. So, so say you use all of these patterns, you know, your systems are like st staying up and uh, nothing can, wrong can happen. Actually, that's not true. If you, act, uh, if, you have to, if you have to fiddle your systems manually, like uh, if, some, uh, if there has to be a human intervention to make sure your system is going on for weeks, like restarting them or something like that. That is a that is that actually introduces a chance of you know uh, introducing the error into the system. So 
what you want is you know as little as uh, a human effort as possible and uh, like there are a lot of things about it like uh, you can set up a uh, deployment and all that but there are two uh, specific points that i actually want to talk about first is uh, have log rotation in place so the worst thing that you want is that you know uh, you have a log which are you know weeks old and one day you realize that you know your service is out of disk space at that point just because of logs because there's no way to log uh, further you, it could bring down your entire service on that host so set up a log uh, rotation like it takes 5 minutes to do it and a lot of folks uh, don't do that but there is something that never actually makes it to the first uh, draft of the system. It's an archiving strategy. So the way archiving data archiving actually works is like people will have a script and the DBA or someone like that would actually you know archive the data for you, and that is really terrible because depending on your system, you know. Uh, 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 dip, it, your uh, uh, be, based on that, you know, you, if you are in case of Flipkart, it, if the order is delivered or if it's customer cancelled, those are terminal states. Like at that point, not, nothing else will be done in that order. We know that nothing else could be done about that order. At that point, we could archive any data associated with that particular order, any unit, anything. So. Your archiving strategy is highly dependent on your domain, and uh, uh, and that's that's something that you know you can always uh, think about uh, when you're actually designing your system, because uh, you once you have your schema set, once you have everything set, you can't you know introduce a different kind of archiving strategy later on. So, uh, lastly, I want to end this uh, talk. Uh, on this key, uh, this uh, quote by Michael Nygaard. He, so uh, Michael Nygaard actually wrote a book called Release It, which is a Bible about you know building resilient systems. Uh, so he says that you know software design actually only talk about what a system should do. It doesn't address what a system should not do, and uh, it's well, uh, and it's to actually. Uh, build really uh, resilient system. It's very important that you know we also think about what system should not be doing, and putting it together. Uh, what we want is you know we want to fail fast. If we realize that you know uh, the call we we are making to the system is going to fail, then we want to fail fast. We also want to bound our resources, use timeouts, at least uh, discover what are the different timeouts by the libraries you're using. Uh, Use circuit breakers at any every integration point in your system. If you're making a call to a different service or something, use a circuit breaker. So if that system goes down, uh, you can clearly use a fallback instead. And that fallback could be a cached value or stale, or it could be just failing fast. And finally, uh, you want to you know isolate your failures. You want to use bulkheads and uh, make sure that uh, uh, if one service is uh, behaving badly. The failure could be contained to just that, and it couldn't. It wouldn't affect other systems. So, so yeah, that's it. That's enough.